Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. We're here to talk about Jung, Carl Gustav Jung. Monday, the 6th of June, is the 50th anniversary of his death. He died in 1961. Um, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, this was worth thinking about, um, not just who the man was, but what his legacy might be today. If you've ever used words like introvert, extrovert, um, the archetypal, collective unconscious, if you've ever done a Myers-Briggs personality test, um, loved or loathed the new age, um, Jung is the person you have to thank for all that. Um, these are his words that have become common currency in our culture. If you've ever read uh, his autobiography, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, a rather peculiar book, um, not really much about anything that happened in the world, all the things that happened in his head, um, you'll know that he had a troubled childhood. He paints his father as a rather weak character, riven by religious doubts, and he paints his mother as a bit of a split personality. Um, on the one hand, she was quite a conventional figure, although suffered from breakdowns. But on the other hand, she was a slightly spooky character too and would sometimes speak to him with this authorial voice um, that uh, hung around in Jung's head. Um, when Jung's father died, she said to him, he left in time for you. And these kind of comments floated around Jung's head as a child. And he developed what he caught, talks about um, his number one and his number two personality. Um, his number one personality was the child of his times, the child of his parents, not very successful at school really. But um, underneath that, if you like, was his number two personality, who was a rather, um, who was a large figure, a sort of timeless figure, in touch with things that weren't just knocking around at the time. And it was his, in a way, his attempt in life was to try and bring the number one and the number two together um, and be open to both. He, he makes a comment about how he's always tried to be open to what comes from his inner life as much as what comes from the outer world. And then um, in 1906 and 07, um, first writes and then meets Freud. Very, very seminal moment in his life. Um, they uh, have this kind of friendship at first sight, you might say, um, for a few years. Um, but right from the word go, it's quite clear that there are tensions between their thought. Um, and in fact, by 1913, just a few years later, their relationship has broken down um, with quite substantial consequences. He differed from Freud too in that he thought the unconscious was a kind of resource for what it is to be human um, rather than a source of befuddlement and oppression. The goal of trying to explore your unconscious is a more rounded humanity, um, not just trying to deal with the repressed contents of your early life. So he has a forward-looking psychology as much as a backward-looking psychology and I think that's uh, a, an important difference between him and Freud. He calls this forward-looking psychology, this personal development, individuation. Um, and um, he thinks this happens mostly at an unconscious level. He also rejects, um, in large part, the Oedipus complex of Freud, um, the idea that um, we have these incestuous, uh, murderous relationships with our parents at a, at a kind of unconscious level. Um, and instead, um, what he suggests resonates very powerfully with more recent work done by people like John Bowlby and Donald Winnicott, the idea of attachment theory, um, that it's um, the love and care that a parent or a primary carer gives to a child that forms the bond. Um, and Jung anticipates that by about 50 years as well. He discovers the archetypes, a very complex word, one that in strange ways is perhaps coming to the fore again with um, su subjects like ethology, like um, to the study of language. Um, but broadly speaking, you might say that um, the archetypes are a very sort of deep level that we never have direct access to, but nonetheless, the archetypes always manifest themselves. They incarnate in our lives in, in very real, tangible ways, particular ways. So falling in love, if you like, would be an archetypal experience. It's something that everybody does. Um, it has this kind of objective quality. Um, but nonetheless, it happens to each in a very particular way. You fall in love with someone in particular. He tries to move there beyond just a behavioralist account of things, falling in love as a behavioralist phenomenon, but tries to introduce some notion of intentionality, that we're persons doing this, um, that there's a, there's a certain kind of freedom involved in this, and a certain kind of action on our part. And that balance between behavior and intentionality is one I think that modern science um, we, is very much trying to grapple with too. 
Today, um, I think he is, uh, he's important because, in a way, we live in a more Jungian world, psychotherapeutically speaking, than we do a Freudian world because of this business of uh, how he understands the unconscious, how he understands parental relationships. Um, and I think that we still live in an age which he described as an age trying to find its soul. Um, and I'm sure that by his turn to the inner life, this trying to pay attention to what comes from within as well as what happens without is still an important message we're trying to get to grips with 50 years on. So I think of um, psychotherapy in a very crude way. There's a, there's a kind of shallow end and there's a deep end. At one end of psychotherapy, I guess you have the more empirical uh, practices like uh, cognitive behavior therapy, for example, where uh, you're encouraged to look at patterns of behavior and are given quite explicit tasks to perform which might help you overcome them. So if, like me, for example, you have a fear of riding in the underground, your CBT therapist might encourage you actually to um, essentially go through the process of getting on the train, perhaps with a friend, just going on for one stop the first time, then two stops the next time, and it lines at diff different depths. Towards the other end, then you, you do have kind of Freudian and Jungian psychoanalysis. In a sense, they, they're both trying to achieve a similar aim, uh, which is to uh, produce, for want of a better phrase, happiness in the person who's on the couch. But I think there are some interesting differences. If you see a Freudian analyst, uh, what the Freudian analyst will help you do is to work through, and Freud's word for this is literally durcharbeiten, to work through material that's got trapped in your unconscious that needs to be ventilated in some way. So it's about aerating the psychic system in order to resolve uh, the, so far, the so far unresolved issues that have uh, been locked up there. I think in Jungian uh, psychotherapy, perhaps the goal is somewhat more ambitious in that it's not just a question of uh, removing the kind of psychic detritus, but uh, achieving a kind of integration of the different aspects of your uh, character or, or persona. So in a certain sense, it's a slightly more ambitious process. But it's also a, um, a kind of deeper process because the kind of unconscious involved in Jungian analysis and Jungian theory is arguably more unconscious than the unconscious in Freud. Uh, we're, we're all creatures who want things. This is the most fundamental desire, according to Freud. The, the ego is the wanting agency. And his name for it is the I, des ich. But we soon learn that we can't actually have everything that we want, um, partly because there are rivals for the things that we desire and want, particularly in the form of the father or siblings. So the ego part of us meets a limit, and that limit Freud describes as the superego, the thing which in some senses uh, keeps the, the ego in check. And then with the wishes that are... Uh, thus proscribed or prohibited, uh, there has to be some sort of outlet, and they go effectively into the unconscious. So the unconscious, in Freudian uh, language, is the repository of repressed wishes. And it pertains, therefore, to the individual. So I will have wishes from my childhood, typically, that weren't met. They've uh, formed the kind of dark sump of the unconscious, and for the most part, that's okay, except when it starts to distort your behavior or make you deeply unhappy, in which case you then have to look into what's in that rubbish bin of repressed wishes and take them out and try and reckon, reconcile yourself with them. Jung, uh, on the other hand, uh, and this is one of the points of tension and divergence between Jung and Freud, will say that that model of the... Uh, simply personal unconscious, the one that belongs to me, doesn't quite go far enough. And that uh, there is, I mean, I put it very crudely, there is a level beneath the personal unconsciousness which connects us with something even more unconscious or more occult than we might like to think and that can't simply be explained in terms of desires that were trapped or uh, impeded in our infant life. And this is where we get into the collective unconscious. So is there figures, uh, kind of mandalas, and other uh, tropes and images with which we are all affected in some way? And that might, for example, come out in either dreams or in myths. 
So typically we think our dreams are our own, or at least we do if we're Freudians, we just dream our own dreams. But to a certain extent, if you're a Jungian, when you dream, you are dreaming, um, you're dreaming the dream of humanity, to put it in, in melodramatic terms. You're, you're dreaming a dream that belongs to other people as well, because the contents of that dream will exist in a kind of, um, in a kind of world soul, a kind of world repository from which they are taken. And that possibility means that, effectively, we might all be connected to one another in a much profounder way than Freud ever, ever quite got to. And uh, for me, I, th I find this quite fascinating, that the unconscious actually could be something that crosses between people's minds rather than being boundaried by this or that person's mind. And I think from that, you begin to get um, kind of theories about things like telepathy, and uh, kind of morphic resonance and so on. And that's where I think a more occult, or certainly more esoteric strain of kind of Jungianism begins to develop, or at least picks up from other work done by Jung, an anthropologist, for example, about collective universal symbols. I first started reading Jung in the uh, 1970s when I was in, in my teens. And uh, this is because he was, he was part of this kind of countercultural canon uh, of writers at the time. Uh, and he died just on the cusp of um, what's called, the, or at least what I've called in, in another book of mine, the occult revival of the 1960s. And um, Jung had been picked up by this um, alternative counterculture, you know, new age, uh, what we sort of call it today, um, uh, sensibility. And um, it's interesting because uh, it's through that, I think, that Jung's ideas really have been disseminated. He had been um, picked up by this kind of grassroots popular culture precisely because of these interests that he had throughout his life in the occult and the paranormal and the spiritual and the mystical. His doctoral, uh, his, his thesis was on the so-called you know, pathology, uh, the, the, the pathology of so-called occult phenomena. Uh, and uh, what he doesn't tell you in, in that paper, which is written in very good um, Germanic uh, academies, is that uh, this, he was, it came out of these seances that he was involved with, with his family. Uh, the medium was his cousin who was in love with him. Uh, the seances were instigated by his mother um, who felt that uh, her uh, father, Jung's grandfather, uh, was trying to get in touch uh, with them. And the reason she believed that was that Jung's grandfather himself uh, was a firm believer in, in, in spirits. Even though there's evidence, obvious evidence, that he's interested in this sort of thing, at the same time, he pursued science. Uh, Jung's first uh, interest was archaeology, and, and had his parents had the money to send him to a university where they had a course in that, he might not have become a psychologist uh, at all. He, he might have become an archaeologist. But there's very similar uh, patterns to you know, digging deeply into the psyche and digging deeply into the past. When uh, Freud uh, and Jung broke up, um, famously, Jung went into this crisis. Uh, depending how you look at it, it was a spiritual crisis or a psychotic episode or the mother of all nervous breakdowns, but he produced the Red Book, among other things, that was published a few years ago. If you know what the Red Book is, it's this huge tome of Jung's inner dialogues and conversations and experiences that he had during this um, traumatic um, period in his life of uh, several years following the breakup with Freud. Um, and so he kept this, this interest in this inner world uh, linked to telepathy, linked to occult phenomena, linked to religion and God was always there in Jung, but the tension between that and the scientist was there as well. And even in, towards the end of his life, uh, Jung was insisting that he was a scientist. I mean, ever since the break with Freud, everyone said, oh, well, this is, you know, he's not. He's, Jung's gone off his nut. He's into all this mythology. Uh, we, I told you from the start he was into ghosts and all that sort of thing, and we couldn't trust him, and now it's come out in the open. Um, but he kept this tension of wanting to uh, affirm that he was a scientist throughout most of his career. So he, he played his occult cards pretty close to his chest. And it wasn't until um, late in his life, uh, in the last days of World War II, that um, his attitude towards his persona, let's say, of a scientist, uh, he was became more open to uh, being a little uh, loose about that and to admit more of the, the mystical side. And this tension between affirming that he's a scientist, he's not a mystic, he's not an occultist, this, this loosens up a bit and he comes out of the closet a bit about um, his occult and mystical interests.
And already in 1940, he's talking about the age of Aquarius. And then he starts talking about it in a book called Aeon, uh, the phenomenology of the self. He starts talking about it as well in a book about flying saucers. Uh, 1951, he starts openly talking about synchronicity, the meaningful coincidence. Um, the, you, you know, the idea that uh, something that you dreamt or something that you thought and some actual event uh, in, in the outside world are meaningfully connected. Um, these are all things that Jung had talked about uh, in his books, but they're buried deep inside them. Jung um, is one of the most brilliant um, thinkers of the last century, but he's also one of the most um, uh, clumsy and, and in many ways in, in presenting his ideas. And I'm not sure whether he just was a bad writer or whether he had double thoughts about these things and he wanted to kind of you know, give and take at the same time. There's a labyrinthine quality to Jung's writings that he never quite gets to the point and you kind of have to uh, infer what he's getting at. Um, Mark had mentioned active imagination. This is a process that Jung developed of coming, get, getting into these inner dialogues with these figures, these entities, these people who talk to him inside his head. But the most important paper about it, he wrote in 1916 during, the, the, he was smack in the middle of this crisis when all this information, all this rich uh, detail and, and map working of the conscious was going on, and he never published it. Uh, it only emerged about 40 years later in a, a, a newsletter of a small Jungian society somewhere in New York. Um, so he had this tendency to sort of hide these sorts of things, just like in his uh, early paper. He didn't own up that, yes, my, my cousin was the medium, and I, we'd been going to these seances for a long time, or my mother had been talking to spirits for, like, years already. He's not in there. He's extracted his sort of personal involvement in that. And this is something he did throughout his career. And I think one reason, it's not the only reason, because I think he had a prudent career sense. I think he was aware that if he came out in the open and talked about how uh, he arrived at many of his ideas by talking to these figures in his head, people would come out and say, well, you know, he's psychotic. They said that anyway, many of them, but many, many more would, would say it. And this is why he kept the Red Book hidden away uh, for years and years. I, I try to make this point that in some ways um, we live in a more Jungian rather than a Freudian world because we see relationships with parents to do with attachment rather than to do with Oedipal complexes and because we see life going forwards and the unconscious resourcing that rather than being this troubling thing that pulls us backwards. Do you buy that? Um, I buy the, I mean, I like the phrase that we live in a more Jungian than a Freudian world. And if I were to agree with it, it would be on different grounds, actually. Uh, not because of that sense of going forward or a relationship with the past, but again, because of this notion of connectivity. Um, I mean, there is a real sense in which we live in a more interconnected world than, than, than ever before. And those interconnections don't simply happen at the social, political, or economic level. They also happen at emotional levels and psychological levels, too. And I think insofar as uh, Jung gives us the beginning of a language to talk about psychological connectivity, I think that's, that's probably true. You know, there is a, you know, we're in a Jungian, uh, we are in a Jungian phase. We live in this sort of slightly zero-sum world where it's a way you have to pick one or the other and in picking one you trounce the other. Mm, um, mm. Do you think there is, uh, how, how might we have more of a meeting point and how does it happen for you yourself? I try to maintain, you say, this kind of balance or tension between, between, between the two sides. Uh, I think I do come down on the side of Jung's more esoteric, mystical pursuits. Um, I'm not trying to argue he is a mystic because that isn't that important to me one way or the other. Uh, it's not that important to me whether what he did was science or not. I think one of the problems we have is we, we, for a long time, we tend to regard science as the sole arbiter and source of truth and, and, and um, you know, uh, verifiability and so on and so on. And I'm nothing against science, but there's a certain, how should we say it, um, reductive, I would say, ideology that I would call scientism that um, would see what Jung is doing as just you know, flaky nuttiness. And while I can understand some of the arguments against that, I think they throw out the baby with the bathwater. Likewise, the other side, the New Agers, mystics, whatever, who completely want to reject the scientific empirical world and all that, I think they're also throwing out uh, babies in the bathwater. So I think myself, I, I feel like I've inherited both of these streams in the Western tradition, if you want to put it that way. And the more you look into this, the more you see that it actually it comes from somewhere in the Western tradition already. It goes back to the Renaissance. It goes back to Neoplatonic uh, philosophies. It actually makes a contribution to the culture. In many ways, it's like the culture is unconscious. If you want to say that the archetypes and the collective unconscious, we don't have direct access to them, but we sort of see their effects. I think in many ways, 
in our everyday culture, the Western culture that we, we all share, we do, uh, we can see the effects of this underground stream of the Western esoteric uh, tradition. Uh, and it's not flaky. Uh, people like Isaac Newton wrote more about alchemy than he did about gravity. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna talk about the occult, gravity is the most occult thing I can think of because nobody's ever seen it. I think we have this attitude towards something like the occult or the esoteric that we used to have the same sort of attitude towards sex, let's say. Whereas now many people can talk openly about sex. In fact, we're all encouraged to do that, right? And to not be in denial and to be frank about all this stuff. But we still have this kind of, you know, kind of feeling about the occult. It all has what I call the X-Files effect. There's the woo-woo factor comes in every time you start to talk about it. And you must, you know, either you have to be completely dismissive of, dismissive of it or you're, um, you know, kind of a flake. My sense of where science is at the moment, there may be scientists in the audience, is in fact um, that it's precisely the limits of cognitive reason and rationality that are being encountered now. Mm. It's therefore the task of the scientist and the non-scientist to explore what I call the non-cognitive as opposed to the spooky or the occult or whatever you want to call it. Because cognitive empirical models can only take us so far. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not just non-scientists who are reaching this point, it's scientists themselves who are saying, you know, we can get so far using all these uh, kind of enlightenment tools and enlightenment rationalities. But at a certain point, we've got to say, hang on, perhaps we need a new language, a new methodology. It feels to me we are on a certain boundary in science at the moment, and uh, maybe we need new methods for, for breaking through.